Good evening. Um, my name is Moisan Mostafi. I'm the dean here, and I just wanted to welcome all the uh, admitted MDES, MDE uh, candidates here to the GSD. It's really wonderful that you're here. I had hoped that we would actually meet earlier today and we would have some time together, but somehow our calendars didn't quite work out at exactly the right time. That was good for you. So I'm really happy to be extending uh, a welcome. I, I'm so happy that you're here. I hope you've had a good day. Uh, both the MDES and the MDE programs are really such important parts of the school. And um, over the last uh, probably five or six years, we've spent a lot of time trying to work on ways in which the focus, the attention that these, these programs receive is uh, something that, that is at the forefront of our attention. I think a lot of our faculty have been really focused on this. Uh, we are so proud of the faculty who are involved with this uh, program, and we are so proud of the people who are um, participating in these programs. What is really, uh, in a sense, um, significant about both the MDES and the MDE program is that they're really dealing with significant domains of, of thought that have uh, important uh, um, consequences in terms of the built environment broadly, and that they also are designed so that they are simultaneously areas of, um, of specialization, of focus, but they also enable a great deal of interaction between them. And this is, uh, this is, uh, this is important in a way uh, to be able to come to the, to the GSD and to concentrate uh, on a particular area, but at the same time know that there is, in a way, a kind of broader milieu, there is a broader uh, context for the work that you are doing and that you are able to participate and, uh, and engage with a much richer, uh, in a sense, domain of, of interaction across these different disciplines. And I think the um, <clears throat> open projects that you've been hearing about today is also a more recent attempt to try and um, make the concept of, of interaction across the different tracks of uh, the MDES program, for example, uh, much more formally uh, located, which I think is also uh, very important. Obviously, we would love to, after the talk, to hear from you uh, if you have any thoughts or, or questions. Um, uh, and um, once again, it's, it's great that you're here. Uh, those people who are here for the MDE program, of course, we're now going to be entering the second year of the MDE program, and that has also been such a vital uh, program based on the collaboration between the, the GSD and SEAS, which is the engineering school here, and really focusing on, on sort of key challenges that, that face us and face the environment, uh, and at the same time combining that with entrepreneurial approaches towards sort of addressing those. So, in a way, the various the tracks that are in the MDES program, the eight tracks, many of them uh, benefit, I think, from the work, the, the artistic practice of um, uh, Janet, who's here with us. I think Janet Cardiff is, is really, it's we're so happy that you are here. And uh, as you know from the material that I think some of you have uh, received, uh, Janet has been working for quite some time with her partner, um, George Burris Miller. And after living in uh, Berlin for quite some time, then moved back to Canada some 10 years ago and uh, has been uh, very much engaged with uh, her practice um, across, the, across the globe in, in, in many different locations. Um, one of the things that I think is, is um, I sometimes feel when we're working in the field of design and we make projects, we make drawings, is that it's, it's occasionally, it's a little bit akin to uh, making a kind of silent movie in a way because you make, you make models, you make assumptions about the people who will be living in these things, but it's all either in the imagination or it's in the realm of drawings and models in a way. And so the, the, the thoughts that we all have about how a landscape will live, how a, a house will be occupied, 
and you know how a city will be will be a place for its inhabitants is actually constantly in in the realm of our imagination. I think the work that Janet and her partner are involved with is really a world that also helps to through sound, through other forms of participation, through movement, through walking, makes that world alive. And we have been very much, many of us, enthusiastic about this kind of uh, practice, about the relationship between performance and, in a way, the way in which we, we imagine things. And that intersection of performativity and uh, the, the spatial dimension of our practices is, is really something that is absolutely critical to what we do. It's with that in mind that also a few years ago we set up, for example, a, a, what we call a platform here at the GSD, which is a transversal uh, academic intellectual project across our departmental structures called a Sensory Media Platform that has been led by a number of our faculty, including uh, some of the faculty who are here, like Silvia Benedetto and, uh, and others. And I think the purpose of that has been to go beyond the, the purely visual dimension by actually considering the sonic, the haptic. And again, uh, I feel that many of the tracks of the MDES program really um, um, consider the relationship to the built environment in a much broader sense that actually connects very directly with questions of memory, history, temporality, as well as, of course, the sonic dimension that is so much part and parcel of what um, Janet has been doing. And I think we're all in for a treat. So would you please join me in welcoming Janet Cardiff? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very encouraging to hear about so much collaboration between um, different sort of media and different um, practices. Because in Berlin, when we lived there, that's one shock I got, that we would be invited by theater directors or by symphonies or, or architects to work with and collaborate with. But it doesn't happen so much in North America. And I think it's a really good sign. I think it's, it, it just makes sense. And um, naturally, I think um, I've always been drawn to, to that type of practice. I wanted to show you a couple of early works because I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, collaborations between George and I. George and I met in art school. I was a graduate student. He was a, a great, you know, in, no, he wasn't in grade two. He was a, in second year, so he wasn't that young. But um, anyways, uh, so we sort of, he was a painter and I was a printmaker. But for some reason, even our first date we got together, we started making works together. And uh, it was like a recording of, we went to a crazy concert, recorded it, and then put it in front of uh, the TV with the sound off with a you know, six pack on the side. So that was our kind of first collaboration. And then we started making films together. But we didn't, but he helped me in my practice and I helped him in his practice. And he was very much into this idea of, um, he started working a lot of kinetic sculptures in the 90s. We started officially working together in 95, but we actually were together in, in 1982. So it's a very long time before some people were born. And George's, I, I want to show you this piece because it has, it has the elements that keep reoccurring in a lot of our works. And this idea that what we know of technology, we can't believe. That there's magic involved. And it doesn't take much to have our beings want to be involved in that magic. And he was able to, he, went, he, um, he quit painting because it was a modernist school. And then he went into a program in Toronto that involved electronics. And that was his sort of natural forte. We were both into, we did Super 8 films. We, we did lots of filmic work. And so the whole sense of noirish films and kinetic sculpture. And then I started adding sound into prints and then eventually just gave up the printmaking because I, I, once I started working with sound, I realized this is the medium for me. It 
works in a way with memory that nothing else, else works. I mean, you're having to remember the sentence that I said last, right? And it sort of fades away, but there's little pieces of it that come out. And then something that's important to you isn't, isn't important to you. And then I started working in this way with walks and installations because I liked how the viewer or the listener started adding their whole memory bank to the actual piece. So, um, let's see. I just want to show you how this one functions. controlled by a beep that he triggered when he was jumping, imagining his, and his beeping on the trigger made the TV move. So then he, then I filmed him while he's doing it. And then I actually did this um, Foley sound. It's my footsteps that you hear because he couldn't coordinate that. But he was very, he did a whole series on this idea of aerodynamics and how video actually, once you move the video or once you move the monitor, it doesn't become a flat dimension, uh, flat sort of virtual space anymore. It actually becomes a physical space. And at the same time, this is 1992 as well, um, I was working on uh, bare speaker installations and were really involved in this idea of cubist narrative. For some reason, I just loved any films that dealt with how to, it's hard to describe because I have a, a sense of I see sound in ways and I always want to make that sort of environment for the viewer. So I came to George with an idea, how I, we had this old table that we found and I loved how there was the memory of the marks in the table, it was an old carpenter's table and I want to have uh, sensors on the tables and then have the sound come around and then I wrote script and then I recorded sound effects, took stuff from the TV, did all sorts of things. And so of course George figured it out because he's, um, he's really good technically. That's why we make a good partner <laughs> team because I'm not anymore, I used to be a bit, but he's so good that I just let him do everything. And then, but I love experimenting with ideas. I'll give you a little... This shows a little bit of the soundtrack and how it started to, to mix. You ain't gonna get away with it, kid. What do you want? I see you. Hanging around him. Making love to him. Kissing him. Maybe I do like him. That's none of your business. Picture this image. A small bedroom at night. Outside, you can hear the wind in the trees. A light shines onto the bed. A man. So that was, um, that's a really seminal work for me and it comes back in some of our later works. And today I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to speed through some and pause on some, but show you different thematics that we've been working on because there's so many different ways to come at a problem. Like if you're trying to work with sculptural sound, then you can work with ideas of speakers around, bare speakers, or you can work with audio walks, which I was experimenting in a residency in Banff, 1991, and also working on the soundtrack for the previous piece there. And they had a Sennheiser dummy head, and I started experimenting with it. And then I started, I was recording walks just on a regular playback um, machine. And I start, and I pushed the wrong button and ended up hearing my voice talking and describing things as I was walking along. And it was one of those aha moments. And I thought, this is really cool. So I, I got my four track out. <laughs> a four track is that was cassette deck. <laughs> and it was a way of mixing four tracks. That was really amazing back then. And um, made the first audio walk that um, I did so that you'd have, and I was really intrigued with when you listen to it in the very same site, and that's what's important about the audio walks, is you're getting a, in this case, I, I gave a few friends the cassette deck and a headset, and then it, they were given directions to walk around the particular forest. 
and you'd hear virtual people run by or hear fake birds and all that. And I realized that I was creating a film sound um, soundtrack for the physical environment. And that really intrigued me in how for every person that's walking, it's a different piece. So it's, and also I could have the surrogate relationship with the viewers because I didn't have to be there and talking to them and like whispering in their ears and stuff, but I could have this thing that I just send them off with. And I didn't even know if it was art back then. And actually I was kind of afraid to show it to anyone because people really didn't, it's, it's surprising to think, but 1991 in Canada, um, luckily there was a curator, Kitty Scott, who went like, oh, this is pretty neat. And then she um, gave it to someone else who was curating a show in Denmark. And, and then it, it actually, um, it went on from there and it ended up in Münster, Germany. But it started getting invi invited all over the world to do these projects. And I think in um, 10 years did 20 different audio walks. And how I record them is we go to a particular site, George ended up um, editing them. And I just want to talk about technology and how it's such an inspiration. Because, you know, first it was a four track and then it was reel to reel we did a walk. And that's really impossible because you're working as a visual artist invisibly, having to work in a studio and do a, a, a like a written script when this sound goes up, when this sound goes up. And then Pro Tools came out with a computer that could actually do it in 1996. And it was really hard to do like eight tracks and have the computer still run. So that sort of thing made a huge difference. So I think a lot of our works actually got, um, once the technology came out, then we were stimulated to do something. So I haven't described that these are recorded with binaural. That's a piece that was in um, Central Park that's actually still available online. If you're in New York and want to do an audio walk in Central Park, you can download some photos and um, other things. But this is a piece, the last audio walk that um, we did, because it started to be a format where we kind of got bored with it. I got bored with writing the scripts for it. They became, um, you know, we always like to push ourselves in every different piece we're making. Or actually, I really like to learn from my art. And it's surprising how what you make, I'm sure you all find that here in a, in a work environment like this, because it taught me a lot about ideas of virtual reality. It taught me a lot about um, where a body can be related in space. Because what you do is you, I walk around with this blue head and she's got um, two microphones in her ears and it records three-dimensionally because it's the way we hear. Because if I go like this, the microphone records it directly here, but with this microphone, it records the sound bouncing to that wall and then back here creates a three-dimensional picture. So when you're listening with headphones, it is a three-dimensional thing. It's called binaural, basically two ears, two audio experiences. So this is me directing the invisible soldiers. And every site there is, it's like creating Foley sound. You're creating environment. These people are running by. And it's so important to be right exactly on the spot because you don't realize how much you know about sound when you're listening to a situation. Because if you listen to this piece in this room, it sounds like a recorded thing. But when you're on location listening to the sound that was recorded maybe a month before or two weeks before in the very same location, then there's slightly different sounds, like maybe a dog walks by and it's not there in, the, in reality. But you have this syncing up so you have the recorded space, you have the physical space, and then you have this third space that, that creates a new world. And that's what I was very interested in. As well as the textures. This, is a, this was a um, Luciana Museum, Denmark, which is a wonderful museum. It's one of the best museums architecturally, I think, for um, many generations. Um, I can't remember when it was built. But the museum itself actually has so many different spaces for the viewer to encounter, like low ceilings, high, high galleries, underground galleries, ones where you see the outdoors. And this was a George Trakas sculpture that I walked on from the museum. To me, textures are so important. And the George Trakas sculpture had a variety of textures because you, you unconsciously hear the footsteps. And you know that you're walking on metal when you're walking there. You know you're walking on stone. So, 
it's funny because it's just like when I used to teach drawing or I used to, when I, I took a, a pretty basic um, traditional BFA. And so uh, when you're drawing, you think about textures, you think about this and that. It's the same with sound. When you're looking at a location, you're always thinking about textures, small space, an alleyway versus a big space. So whenever um, George and I are designing the walks, we have to think about, like this one is, um, it's still available, I think. It, it, um, the building has totally changed. It used to start at the, let's see, there's part of it. it used to start at the Whitechapel Public Library, and now it's the Whitechapel Gallery. And, but they, I think they still will let you do it. And it starts off the library sounds, and then you walk through. But that was important, this kind of space. This is kind of like a Jack the Ripper space. And then you end up in the Liverpool station, and you go through all various things. So you get a sense. Your body totally gets a sense. As it's Turn left around. at this corner. So this is just a very short sound excerpt from the actual piece. And this was in the east end of London, uh, around Brick Lane. I don't know if any of you remember, there was a series of bombings by a, um, basic, I think he was a homophobic person in the end, and um, terrorist in ways. And he, he was putting bombs in various places, but bombed Brick Lane like 10 minutes after I walked by, basically recording. But in this piece, we used a lot of sound effects because London has such a history. You know, there's sounds you can bring from the war, there's sounds you can bring from the Blitz, and, and then there's, there's car alarms, there's this and that, from all different time periods. Like if we even took you know, some helicopters from Vietnam. And I love how you can take all these different spaces and put them together and they create one new space. It makes you think about so many different things philosophically, about how we exist within these spaces and how we bring all these spaces with us sound-wise, acoustically. Turn left at this corner. Sorry, one thing I wanted to say. The sound you hear is the sound that she's hearing. So you're not, you're not actually hearing the actual environment that she's in. You're hearing the, the recorded audio. Turn left at this corner. We're on Fashion Street now. The shopkeeper on Brick Lane described her as tall, with long red hair and an American accent. This is the street that I saw in the book, a narrow lane with children watching the camera. Only there was a lot of fog in the air and cobblestones. The book told the story of a man who lived in one of these houses. For 20 years, he searched for the woman he loved, waiting for her to come back, playing his violin in his room. How can we just walk over their footsteps and not remember? There's a lime... Oh, she was going to say there's a lime green car parked there. One of the parts of the walks is we always um, look in the area and find what is reoccurring all the time so that when people are listening to recorded audio, then they see the physical reality that lines up with the... the they know it's recorded, so it gives the, the, the sort of strange... It sort of dislocates people. Um, but I have to hurry on here to get a few. I want to get a few of these points because it, I think it's very interesting how you learn from your practice so much. Um, this lining up of the audio made me think about, well, what about photographs? So the Central Park Walk actually used this idea of uh, found photographs. And like Molson was saying about researching the area. In London, I did tons of research and historical research in this area and would bring up particular stories. And there was, I didn't actually, I posed these photos so they weren't real, but most people thought they were actually found photos because I made them look like 1970s photos. And, and the idea there's so many couples in the park and then brought out this story. But it gave the idea of the video telescopes. And in this one, I'll show a very short excerpt just because it really, it's, it's hard to describe this work because it's very much about being there at site. So um, as we were talking earlier about documentation, it's almost impossible. But, but um, 
I think this gives a little bit of an indication. By the way, this is the old SF MoMA before the renovation. Like this is 1999, so now that the wall isn't even there. First they put a wall there, and there was no parking lot, and then now there's not even, there's not even a street next door. So what's inside the, the telescope is actually a, a recorded video on a remote camera that um, was recorded, the tracking was recorded. I love her smile, so I always have to wait for that. But that gave us the idea that one day I was, we were sitting having coffee and I was just playing around with this one of these, you know, high eight video recorders, fancy thing. And um, George got up and went in the kitchen and then I replayed the video and went, this is the same as a telescope. Why not have the people be the, you know, the moving around instead of the telescopes moving around? So then we were invited to do a, an audio walk in Pittsburgh. For uh, and I said I had said to Madeline Grinstein, the curator there. Well, I have this idea I'd like to work on. I don't know if it'll work. We've never done one before, but we want to do a video walk. So we had to buy all these cameras and and had a sort of matrix story. And then 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 we did one in um, the theater in in Berlin, the Hebel Theater in Berlin, by a director who's asked us to do a couple projects. And it's it's really great because they still mount it occasionally when the theater's empty. But now it's on an iPod, or iPod Touch. And it went backstage and everything. But what happens when, and this is in Kassel um, for Documenta, the last Documenta, and it's in the train station. And it's interesting with historical stuff, in Germany you don't have to show much at all because the history is so thick there that if you, show one little thing. This happened to be, uh, just by chance, because we liked the site, there were a couple of various interesting textures and, and lots of places to go, as well as you could see the video screen. It wasn't too bright. But also this was um, a train station castle where they, on track 13, they'd shipped Jewish people to the camps. So one of the things was to find where that was and just show it. And, you know, and then there was a dance sequence and stuff. It was about a variety of things. But we've, we've worked and worked trying to figure out how to show documentation of this. And so George has got a you know, green screen in a, a little camera here. And it sort of works, so you can see a okay. little bit of it. Turn the camera on. Press That's the video button. Loud. I'm sitting here right now with you in the train station in Castle watching people pass by. It's very intimate in ways, watching people. You can see how they walk, so you can tell if they're happy or sad or, or lost somewhere in their mind. This video will be an experiment. We're like those prisoners stuck in Plato's cave. We watch the flickering shadows on the screen. Try to align your movements with mine. Move your screen up to the left as I do. A red coat. I used to have one. Wonder where it went. So many people wear black here. Garbage 
which pills have moved. Do you see the musicians? They're between the pillars now. Let's get up. Follow them. one of those happy accidents. <laughs> Oops. So that's where they start. There always has to be a handout system and then there's a couple guys waiting behind and then they, and it's important to me that they actually go individually. So you don't have that sense of that you're in a crowd. So it's it's always the the ergonomics of a piece is is um, part of the piece and the people who hand it out are always part of the piece. I just want to show you this. This is a George has a steady cam at the back, and a cinematographer we're working with there. And then these are the fake crew that we're we're um, photographing the ballerina, and it was minus twenty in this train station that day. And that poor ballerina would be like do this, and then she'd run off get her coat on. It was so cold to do this production. Germany had a very cold spell. So now I'm going to skip to that was 2012. But I want to show you, I won't show you much video of this at all, but um, we were trying to figure out how to use this binaural within a sort of theatrical situation so that you'd put on the headset and go in. This is a piece that's one person for every, and it's a five minute long piece. It was a disaster at openings because there were such huge lineups. But it's, it was a sort of a Hitchcock theme of a little opera singer that we had a little video projection of. And it's called Playhouse because everything's made of cardboard. But it's, it's a, uh, you couldn't tell from that, but maybe from this one. This was the one we thought, oh, it's great. It's like three people at a time. And when it first, it actually showed at the Tate Modern opening and people were grabbing them off other people's heads, the headphones, so that didn't work very well. And I don't know if you can see here, but it's actually an architectural model that's in 3D perspective. So that the little seats at the front are very tiny, and then they got bigger as you went back. And then we, George and I made this film, and had some breaks at the end. And there's a shooting in the theater, which was very kind of prescient. And it's kind of a film noir film. And then we were invited to do the Venice Biennale. And we thought, well, we'll make a bigger piece the Canadian pavilion is like the tool shed between the British and the German pavilion. And it's that shape. <laughs> so we basically made a, a structure that was would fit into it. And um, then it's a bigger theater. But we really pushed the whole idea of the cubist space here and cubist narrative and cubist film so that this piece starts with the sound all around you and then it goes into the film, and then a character comes forward. Like this is, like we recorded within the box with the head, and then bringing in other sounds, we recorded in an empty apartment room, and another singer. And then. I heard a man pass by under my window last night. I listened to his footsteps as they faded into the distance. Only the second person this month. How long have I been here? It 
It's time to wake up now. That's actually Carolyn Kristoff answering her phone in the, in the physical sculpture. But we recorded, we'd made a film, and then we recorded it regular with a boom mic, and then we re-recorded in the Delphi Theater. And whenever you listen to it in the actual artwork, it sounds like you're in a big theater because it's recorded with binaural there, but there's a plane goes over. So in Venice, you thought there was a plane going over, but it was actually in Berlin that was going over. Do you understand what I mean? It's kind of hard to explain because it's, um, it's a difficult medium to, to show. This one was a, a fun one because, uh, oh, Volker Spangler, who's a, acted in 14 Fassbinder films. He was he's ama amazing brain, amazing character. And then at the end, we actually burnt down a house. I phoned up my dad and said, have you taken down that house yet that it's on your extra property? He goes, no. Can I burn it down? I said, sure. <laughs> so got the local fire department. And that's how the seats. That's a problem with um, the binaural. You have to have headphones. So this was another aspect of our work is we worked with totally bare speakers and worked with complete sound. And um, the very same year that we did the Paradise Institute at Venice and also moved to Berlin, we uh, produced this piece. And it all came about because some a singer I had hired recognized I really loved the three-dimensional sound. And so she said, have you heard Spaminalium by Thomas Tallis? I said, I can't remember. And so when I listened to it on two speakers, I went, this is just crazy. I want to hear it in 40 speakers. And sometimes we get lucky because I said to George, we can do this. It'd be easy. Just, you know, have 40 CD players. And he goes, no, that won't work because if they're slightly out of phase, they'll just go like, totally have it this phasing sound. And so right at the moment, um, two, Tascam put out 24 output um, machines and nobody had those before and so we were able to actually put those together and um, sync up 40 s tracks of separate sound and record 40 singers actually there were 60 singers because there's three kids for every soprano voice and we co recorded uh, it in a dead space and then so that whenever we take this piece and it's it's showing all it's like, um, I call it the ever-ready bunny because it just goes everywhere and never wears out. But um, it's, it has to be tuned for every particular space. It, uh, we have a, I have a tone meister I work with and like this is a, a reconstructed chapel within the um, National Museum in Canada. And this is a the last bar and the first bar, and then that, that first one. On yeah. The so we recorded even while the singers were just uh, taking a break. And then, um, let's see. That's me. To give them that sense of actual people coming out. Other. That's all I'll play because I, it's really hard for me to hear it on two speakers because I'm used to hearing it on 40 and um, it sounds way better on 40. But um, it's shown a lot of different spaces and I've learned a lot about acoustics and a lot about museums and we were talking about ideas of how the sound systems in museums, they say, oh, the curators say, yeah, it's a really quiet space, it's great. And we go there and we go like, what's that buzz or what's that? sound and so or, so we have to um, we have a we have our tone meister go to every particular space make sure acoustically 
it uh, sounds good. It's not, you know, the funniest thing is some of the, oh, I'm sorry, I went to turn that off. It's supposed to be off. Oh no, I see it's on red. Some of the most beautiful spaces actually sound the worst. Like the worst is glass and cement. And um, uh, let's see, some of the, we discovered that you can't show in any carpeted spaces. Uh, you can't show in, you know, sometimes they have weird spaces like this. This was a terrible space. It was visually beautiful and kind of spooky, but it was um, very hard acoustically. This was a very difficult space. It was the first piece that had shown there after they took down the big kefirs at the, um, it's in the ba Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. So what you can see on the side, there's um, hanging curtains. So we hung curtains this far out from the wall all through the entire space. The very thin piece of material, but it was enough to stop the echoes. Because this piece, The Murder of Crows, we decided that we wanted it was a big jump between 40 Part Motet in 2001 to this one in 2008, but we kept thinking we wanted to make a piece that was the um, same kind of physical audio sound, but um, we had Russian choirs in it, and we wanted to make sort of a film soundtrack with, without much narrative. And uh, it's got big waves, surf, it's got, it's a huge amount of uh, um, sound. And it's uh, usually shown in about a 70 meter long space. So it's shown in a lot of different um, amazing spaces. And one of the themes behind the piece is uh, the Goya, you know the Goya etching? The sleep of reason brings impossible monsters, is that what it's called, yeah? Anyways, this idea of the nightmare it was actually after uh, uh, the Iraq war and um, reading the Herald uh, International uh, Tribune all the time and, and reading about the victims of, of uh, the American bombs. And one, one story I read was a father coming back and, and finding his uh, daughter's arms hanging on the chandelier. And so it created a whole, this is also an opera within this piece as well as we were in, in uh, Nepal for, this is it at the Armory in New York. It was a wonderful space because it's all wooden floors. And we needed a dead space so that you could actually see the sound move around. If you have too much reverberatory space, then, then the sound, um, it just mixes together and you can't really tell where anything is, but it was very important to us to, to be able to see the sound. He brings him in, sort of dragging him, saying he decided he'd run for it, but I caught him. And you can see that one of the kid's feet, his foot was, is almost swollen up. His toes are all big and purple. He's crying and looking at us, saying, please help me. So I was in uh, Nepal for six months, and I started having very nightmarish dreams, and so I started recording them. And so this piece uses three different dreams as a structure. And they're all very bizarre dreams, but then we made sounds that uh, sort of go with it, and had a composer in Berlin work with us on it. Then in Castle, we still, we had to create this sort of structure with narrative for that last piece, because we found that people couldn't, or we couldn't, Remember, it's a 30-minute piece, and we couldn't really put together in a very nice way, aesthetically, the sounds from the beginning to the end to the middle. So we had to sort of join it up with a kind of a sense of narrative to bring it together. But with this piece in the forest, we were able to do it because we had this, the content was a forest. And I'll play you a little excerpt just so you can see. There's 24 speakers recorded surround sound. And so half the time you don't know what's real in the forest. And it's called a short history in ways. Because it, it brings in, we went to reconstructions of, um, of say like a Napoleonic war where they shot muskets and recorded that. And we went to, we had 
I went to bomb sites where they're blowing up things, recorded that. We had students in the university near where we live go out into the forest and laugh for us. And record in this technique called ambisonic. So that's a, a piece. It's parts, a lot of these videos are on our YouTube, um, are on a Cardiff Miller site. So if you want to see more, we just don't have the time today. Because I want to get in a certain amount of themes. Because what we started discovering that these these pieces of equipment had a sense of uh, anthropomorphic quality, that they became so physical that you started like people with motet would walk up to them, and they'd feel comfortable walking up to it. But it's every speaker was a singer, so. I knew sort of who that singer was, and I recorded because I, I remember because I'd been there recording. But it's, it became very interesting to me how much personality a speaker or an amplifier could have. So we had, um, we, we, uh, I think this was yeah, 2003, just um, when Bush went into Iraq, um, we had a um, reproduction done of uh, Jimi Hendrix. We had a, it scored and then a really amazing guitarist play it with all the feedback and everything. So when you step on the pedal, you get the same kind of Jimi Hendrix um, feedback um, song. Does everybody know? No, you probably don't. It's um, Jimi Hendrix played the Star Spangled Banner with like tons of feedback as a, as, as to, against the Vietnam War, basically as a protest. And so we were using it in the same kind of way as a, as a protest in ways. But it's a very loud piece. This is one of my favorite pieces. It's a very simple piece. We found a set of slides in our, in our basement that actually had been George's grandfather crossing the country. And I just wanted to talk about this a bit because it, it's about trans, tr transversing through someone else's pictures, a whole landscape. And he never met his grandfather, but it came out that his grandfather on this trip was going from out west Calgary and then went a bit to, into BC and then back and then through the States to New York City where there was a doctor he was going to be meeting for his cancer, which actually didn't cure him, but um, this sort of set of slides ended up being the story of it. But when we were looking at it, I set them up, and then um, I, we set up a recording head, and George and I sat and talked. And we reproduced it by having George's voice coming out one side and my voice coming another. And this piece had been intentioned to be just a part of a big installation. And then when we actually replayed it, we realized we had something interesting. Because what happens is it looks like the voices are controlling. There's some slides in New York at the end. It looks like the, the projector is being controlled by the voices, which is oh, I don't nice. think this, this is Lake Superior. Yeah, this one looks like Lake Superior. So it's just out of order. Yeah, because... Because this is back in the mountains. Yeah. One of the elks. Not the way I was And then this must be when he was hiking, because the mountain sheep only are... Why did they have that one out of order? I don't know. Because now we're back in the mountains. Doesn't make sense. It should go from uh, the mountains to Calvary to the prairies. This is sort of prairie. This looks like Northern Ontario to me. Because it's uh, that kind of swampy and waste now. Now this is definitely a prairie shop though. This is uh, you know. it's you, This is badly organized. <laughs> So anyways, I wanted to show that just as a, it was a way to do almost like a portrait of a collaboration, a couple. And then we did another kind of portrait series where we're talking about a film, and then we had two composers doing, doing uh, soundtracks, doing um, a comp composing as we sort of describe the film. 
a piece on the piano, and then we had a piano player play it back. So you hear George and I describing this weird sci-fi alien zombie film, and then you, the piano player plays it. But we did a, a few musical instruments like this, and then this was actually our first, this is another kind of series that we work in, it's almost theatrical Baroque. And it's called The Dark Pool, and it's in permanent installation in Dusseldorf at K21, if you're ever in Dusseldorf. But it was, um, it was, it became our first official collaboration because we couldn't remember whose idea it was. And we we're just kind of like echoing how messy our studio was, and we kind of enjoyed that. So we just started adding things to it and then adding sound. So it's censored sound as you walk around. But, um, and then this is another piece in the genre, uh, 10 years later, called Opera for a Small Room. And we had the title about four years before we did the piece, because we liked that title. And then we decided to create a situation where the record players were, were being played by the speaker. So the, it's, it's kind of magical, because at one point the record skips, and then the shadow moves in the room, and it fixes the record player. And another point where there's surround sound outside and a train goes by and the chandelier shakes. So it's all kind of like these stage effects. This is also kind of a reference to Crap's last tape, which has always been a, a, an amazing play, you know, Samuel Beckett play. And I've always really enjoyed that. So it's, um, and then the lighting changes and in the end it becomes a rock opera. So it's all, it's, it's actually a sad piece. It's a 20 minute piece that's, it's all about a, a man whose wife left and, and something happened on the road. There was maybe an accident. And in the middle of the stage. This is the beginning. A man sits alone in a room, surrounded by speakers, turntables, and records. It's kind of a funny portrait, but at, at one point, all eight record players are playing all opera songs together. It's just a crazy cacophony of opera. And then um, this is another piece. This came out after, right after uh, all the photos of uh, Abu Ghraib, you know, the torture photos that hit all over the world and the horrendous activities that were going on there. And at the same time, um, I was reading Kafka again and read that in the penal colony and it's about uh, conceptual killing through um, bureaucratic um, punishment and killing. So we decided to ki create a killing machine that you walk in and you press the button and it turns on the piece. And it's a five minute piece and at first we thought we'd have like eight robots and they'd be all dancing and then we realized that robots were too hard to make and too hard to program. So we, we ended up with two. And then it changes the lighting, the, the dentist chair changes up and down. And it's got this weird fun fur on it that looks like it's kind of the color of blood and then a guitar gets hit. And there's different parts to it. This series that we work on is very much, um, it's, it's a reference to theater. It's kind of a hybrid between theater and um, performance art and, and between art, visual art. I'll just show you a little bit just to get the idea of it.
Godfather very much like a lot of the sci-fi movies huh, from the 90s and 2000s. These robots moving around the field, like the Terminator. And then at the end, of course, there's a, a mirror ball. This is one of the uh, musical pieces we made, a collection of our sound files. When you open a drawer, you hear a little bit. Um, the furnace. It's just a couple more pieces I want to show, and then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. This one's over the top, but... Now this piece, we decide to experiment F sharp minor. So we invite a, quite a few musicians into the studio and said, okay, why don't you go with this click track and then play, doodle around, whatever you want to do in F sharp minor. And then we mixed it all together so that we have 70 some speakers here, I think, bare speakers. And I think there's four piano elements coming out and then there's drum there's a rock drum section and guitar in one area but we had them record for a loop of about um, two and a half minutes so that the piece is mixed sorry I didn't tell you there's sensors around the table there's um, I think five sensors in each side so as you walk around your shadow turns it on so if there's one person in the room you'll only hear a little bit and as you walk around the room, if, if, or if there's a couple people, you'll hear a lot. And each sensor, once you move away from it, stays on for six seconds. So it mixes with the other sounds, but it doesn't stay on unless you're there with it. And then we had a, a little bit of sound effects, but mostly it's... Um, let me see here if, if I have some rock and roll at the back end. fast around it. So basically it's 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 kind of like a, a DJ. You can play it like a, a DJ table almost or something like that. It's kind of a conceptual instrument. And this was one of the crazy pieces that um, we've last made. It's, um, it's called the Marionette Maker. And we've done a few pieces with marionettes. And this uh, idea of a, a virtual or a, this little person who you endow with emotions and feelings because they move. But this is also, this isn't me lying there. It's actually a silicon replica of me. Went to a company in Vancouver that used to, um, that does all sorts of stuff for Hollywood and, and making, you know, bodies with heads that fall off and stuff like that. And they cast me. And there's George, he's playing his guitar. And then there's a variety of all sorts of, I, I have a room in my studio that's called, uh, my daughter calls a toy torture area, where I take apart toys and mix them with things. I've learned a lot through um, the idea of play with art, that it's so important. And this piece, I think, is also inspired by the Calder Circus, which I think is one of my favorite pieces ever. But yeah, we had a percussionist come in, recorded them. We rec There's a little opera singer with a piano player. This is the marionette maker. He's sort of designing it all. The story is kind of maybe that, you know, she's sleeping, but she never wakes up. She just ages. But he's sitting there making marionettes as he's waiting for her to wake up. And then this is what, a piece that came afterwards because the piano player wanted another role. And so that little piano player actually, I don't know if this footage shows it very much, but he plays the whole piece. And then um, the sad waltz and the dancer who couldn't dance. This was a shown in the Istanbul Biennale. Carolyn Christoph Bakerjee invited us. 
with a theme of, um, and so the c composition's by an Armenian composer, actually. But the way we found it is we just wanted a sad waltz, and we looked on the internet for sad waltz, and this is what came up. We love the music, so I built a little marionette. I find it a very sad piece. <laughs> Because of the way she's controlled. And the way, even though she's this big, she still becomes a little human. And um, this is the last piece, and we can even just play while we, we talk. But it was made for them. Uh, they have the, the, a building at the Menil in Houston that they had had a reproduction of the, um, what was it called, the Byzantine Chapel from Greece. And, and then it was empty, so now it's going to be their project space. But we were the first in there, and it's basically a big black box that was very tall. So we just decided to make a big mobile, and we couldn't figure out what we wanted to work with. Like we just tried hanging a whole bunch of things, but everything we hung had meaning. And then I shouldn't say this, but George was in the bathtub, and he says, "John, what about mirrors?" I said, "Yeah, that's great because mirrors have this sense of like we found all these antique mirrors and you think about how they've been looked into by so many people and where they've come from they've come from like people from all over the world have traveled as immigrants and brought their mirrors and then the soundtrack is actually a uh, uh, recordings from outer space from nasa and um we have it uh, on a program that's um a random program that changes the lighting and the sounds so that sometimes you're going past the sound of going past Saturn and then sometimes you're going the sound of um, you know past Earth or the one in the moons. So that and then sometimes the lighting changes. But we can just turn the audio down a bit. We're going to try to, um, this piece has to have a very high um, space to, to show in, so there's not many spaces it can show, but um, there's a cathedral in Amsterdam that wants to do a, us to do a piece with, so we're thinking of maybe making it a bit bigger and showing it there. It might be really nice. I'm sure some of the mirrors already came from Amsterdam. It's called the infinity machine because in the center of the piece there's a couple of mirrors facing each other. So I think um, that's the last piece I'm going to show. So I think we're going to have a few questions, but um, thank you very much. the speed version. <laughs> <laughs>
Very good, very good, very good. Can we turn the lights on maybe so yeah. that we can actually yeah, that's see better. you and maybe turn the sound down a bit? Yeah. Thank you. So one thing that for those of you who are new is that at the end of the lectures, we have some questions. And even though you haven't um, rehearsed this, it would be great if we could invite you to um, ask Janet some questions about what she presented. Um, I, I have ask, a question. Uh, where are you? Right here. OK, hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. That was so delightful. And I think I just want to add that it was particularly delightful to hear you describe some of the works that I've experienced before, um, speaking of memory. And um, part of that is that I also love learning from your work. And it's your facility with layering, um, and yet the fullness of experience that, is, that results in that, um, the fullness of all the operations through the body. Uh, so the first question that I have is about uh, spaces that are bad for sound. And if you could describe that more, because that to me sounds like a frontier of, of work, that there's no space that is bad for sound, but you have to learn how to choreograph and how to, how to operate in there. And the second question is about... Do you the, mean interior, interior spaces or physical, like um, natural spaces? You describe, I think they were interior spaces, though, of spaces that you pointed out that were bad for sound, but maybe there are some that I missed. Um, and the second question is, how high do these mirrors have to be hung? Because I have a great idea for where they could go. <laughs> I forget how high it is, actually. But it's about, it's about this high. Yeah, it's about this high. It's about eight meters. About eight meters, yeah. But with, with sound and space, it's interesting how we get invited to some of these spaces, like even with um, landscape architects, um, we've been invited to do a few projects and we, we generally find it a bit difficult because usually landscape architects get to work uh, around um, say harbor fronts or something like that where they want the space reactivated, but it's already a busy space and there's usually a highway next to it. So um, we've never actually completed a project with with any of the projects there. But the last one we were invited to was, um, it was described as this nice little old um, alcove of very ancient olive trees. And we get there and there's a highway right next to it. And we go, like, we, can't, we can't do a speaker piece here because it would just, you're constantly thinking about the traffic going by and you can't. So it's, it's really hard um, with spaces. Some, for Motet, natural light is really nice. For some reason, uh, and the best space I think it's ever shown is the Cloisters in New York City. It's showed at four, four different places in, in New York City, including uh, the MoMA and PS1. And PS1 was nice because there's a wall of windows all the way around. So as you're listening, you're, you're looking at the city. And, and the strange thing was that it actually, we had a show book to go to New York right as 9-11 happened and for PS1, and so Motet was there. We didn't think the show would actually get through customs, but it did. And um, it was mounted so that people could stand there and look at the city, and it was just one of these motive things. So I think, yeah, natural light is really good, but... Um, the hardest materials are the hardest. And the cloisters was so good because the churches are designed for singers. Right? They're designed to have the voices uh, go up to heaven and become angels. So that the stone has all these pock marks. And so acoustically, that's fantastic. Because you can still hear someone talking 10 feet away from you. But start thinking about when you're going around to different buildings and, and seeing if you and your friend can hear each other from, from you know, three yards away or, and, um, but I think your body takes in everything about a space unconsciously. So I th it's, it's really amazing what you guys are doing. So it's, um, it's a very hard problem though too, working with materials, but at the same time being sensitive to how it, is because even you know sense of you know the rawness of the brick here and, and I actually I'm, I'm not going to go into this because that's your specialty. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you. So 
Um, to the extent that you're comfortable, I was wondering if you could talk about your relationship with your partner and how, and if you create a separation in, in your life between your work and... That, that's and an interesting question because not many artists who are also married can work together. But um, it just started out really easily and, and he's not a man with a lot of ego, which really helped because for a while he gave up his his practice to, to edit my audio walks because we became very busy with audio walks for a while. But he wouldn't even take credit for them, which he now he takes, now we do everything. But I think it's, it's if you work as a team, I think it helps. I grew up on a farm and the idea that everybody has to contribute and you just sort of help out and it, it seems to work. But when we when we cook dinner, I, li I like the sort of metaphor of working together. It's like making a meal together because I somehow just automatically go do this and then he does this and somehow we just work around each other and we don't talk about it too much. I'm not very good technically. He's, and I become, as I mentioned, less and less so because he, he has this kind of genius to be able to see any problem and to want to fix it or figure out. Like if he needs to learn a program for it, he'll learn a program for it. Whereas I'd just go like, oh, I'm just going to hire somebody for that or something, you know. Or how do I do this, George? And he'll figure it out. So we kind of, but when either of us comes up with an idea, that it's really good because we, you still have to watch how you respond to that idea. Like you can't say like, oh, that is so goofy. How how could you ever think that? Or like, like that's like, ugh. But... You might think that, but you have to still watch, like saying, well, I don't think so. <laughs> you know? But we're pretty, we're pretty um, blunt with each other. Like it's, and he's an editor that I trust. Like I've written some really bad script, and sometimes it gets past him, but usually he goes, like, crosses out. I have this whole collection of post-it notes I, I came across. It was like, this is so corny. You can't write this. You just blah, blah, blah. You know, like that sort of thing. Maybe I'm telling too much, but... Um. Do you see your your relationship as an undercurrent in any of your work, or has you t have you taken that on as a as the subject of any particular piece? Well, the, the road trip that I sh showed you, actually it was, I ended up editing the audio, because we had all this raw audio of us talking about these slides and how I had put them in the wrong order and everything like that. So I edited out the parts that made me sound bad, but... That kind of thing, um, that's the only piece I think that's really become about us in terms of showing us how we work together and how we relate and saying like, he is a different type of thinker. He's like uh, for the Venice piece, when we were editing that, I did the, a lot of the rough cuts. Like I'll throw things together and then he'll do the fine tuning, but then he's really, really good editor. So then he'll find things and then I'll say, well, but what about this? So we, we seem to really bounce. We're, we're really different. And he works kind of night shift, and I work morning shift. So we have enough time separate that when we come together, it actually works. And we both really trust each other. He, he doesn't like going to museums. He doesn't like looking at art. He likes going to dance performances. And, um, so, but I love going to museums and looking at old paintings or looking at whatever. But um, so it's, we both have a s love reading, and I think a lot of this stuff comes from reading. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know really why it works, but we also have a very strong relationship. And we were like 20 and 23 when we got together, so we sort of grown together, I guess. Hi. Uh, Not that it's all just roses, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. I thought it was really... Fun. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hello. Uh, first, I want to say how disarming it is to hear your voice in person, because it's so <laughs> like such a thread through the work, this kind of calm, sensible, yet commanding voice. Um, but I'm wondering, what's interesting about experiencing your work often is sometimes you disperse the audience, or you isolate an audience member, or you unify them, like some of your work. One feels very antagonized by other members of the audience, and other times you feel very unified. 
Um, like with 40 Part Motet, the cloisters where people were crying, it becomes a very kind of powerful experience. So I'm wondering how you strategize towards an intended audience or respond to how an audience is you know, engaging with your work. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Um, given how active I've found the other members of the audience mm -hmm. to be in terms of your work, like opera for a small room, or mm -hmm. I remember seeing Killing Machine in Miami, and mm -hmm. everyone is just like, what do we do? We press the button, and now we're fucked. Like, <laughs> how do we deal with that? But I don't know how you would predict that or a set of mm -hmm. responses by the audience as you're kind of constructing or imagining the work. Yeah. And I'm wondering how maybe an audience response would shape the work or, or guide mm -hmm. your sensibility towards other works. Well, with the, with the walks, they're quite different than the installations because it's really essential that we don't frustrate people too much and lose them. So we always have test cases. We do the rough edit first, and then we get a few test cases that, um, you know, different people, some curators, some writers, some artists, because artists are much better at finding their ways around than writers or curators. So, but if people end up walking, when, when I record, Sometimes I record on site, but other times I'm always recording the footsteps on site. And I tend to walk with shorter footsteps than someone who's listening. So then there's all this whole ergonomic of um, George actually goes on site with his laptop now and edits while listening to it. So that most times you have to take out about 10 footsteps. Because as you're walking, you're hearing my breathing and you're hearing the footsteps. And it's very much, it's so much part of the piece that the audience and the sound or me, uh, you know, kind of like a virtual me mix. And so that you don't want to have them always like way lost or, um, you know, not syncing up with when there's a building that I say, oh, look at that cement wall. It's got a big hole in it or something. And it's nice that they share because I think it's about this sense of, <clears throat> intimacy and sharing. When I first started doing the audio walks, there was a lot of dialogue about how the Walkman was alienating people, which is kind of a funny dialogue now with all the iPhones and iPods. And then when we did the audio walks, we realized that people would come back and they'd say, oh my, I see way more with doing this than I ever saw. So it wasn't canceling the vision but it was also making them feel really intimate with somebody and sharing with somebody, which I thought was kind of interesting. So, did I answer that enough? Yeah, sure, thank you. It's, it's a complex question because the, the audience is very important for a lot of the works. Hello, I think that was a really great lecture. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Um, what I'm interested to hear from you is how you relate yourself in the early walks you were doing to the marionette ah. in the later ones. Because mm. I find it interesting how um, you earlier described in the first question that your body reacts to the environment, mm. but yet in the walks, the people listening to it are disembodied yeah. in yourself. And then when watching kind of the performance pieces and the theatrical mm. pieces at the end, you're almost embodying the marionette as an emotion. Um, and how you can kind of relate those two parts of your project. Well, I've never thought about that. That's a very interesting thought. Thank you. Yeah. It's, um, the, the walks, the funny thing is, too, when I first started them, there was some dialogue about power and control. And then some people, the, some, there was actually one critic that wrote, well, um, I don't like this sense of control, being told where to go, turn left here and turn that right there, like a marionette. And some of the walks, like the Carnegie one, was actually based on this idea of the voice. I had a Matrix character before the Matrix come on, and he was like a scientist treating the people like they were walking with a maze so that they were like mice. So there is that kind of weird conflict between being controlled by the marionette, um, by the marionette maker, who is myself and George. So, um, um, where was I going with that shit? <laughs> Maybe you can add to this, but <laughs> I had a really good point I was trying to go for there. But uh, it's, um, yeah, but 
it's kind of like that game as a kid when you're, you know, blindfolded and you're led around. There's a certain, um, you know, it's, it's not an S&M an S kind of thing, but it's a certain kind of giving up your power. It's, giving, it's enjoyable to give up your power and get into this idea of play. So there were some people who had a problem with it, but, but most people like to be led and like to get into this idea that it is play and like to line up. And also, what I found is I was surprised that so many people like to behave. You know, they really want to follow, you know, get line up and make sure everything works and, you know, like, and that's why there's, in the Playhouse, the, and I think you saw, saw the Playhouse, didn't you, in Miami, there's one point where the audience around you, which I recorded in a lecture hall when I gave a lecture once, they start to laugh at the singer. And people said that that made them so uncomfortable because, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You know, so you can, we do play with different things that, that do make people feel very uncomfortable. And some, sometimes, too, even the intimacy. Like with my voice, I keep it so it's very neutral. So it sort of just goes into, like, um, thoughts, hopefully, especially with women more so. But there is a sense of intimacy there that can get a little creepy. So it's a, it's a hard thing to, to work with. So I think that's a very interesting comment you made. Thank you so much. I, you know, what I think is um, so apt um, in terms of your presentation and sort of seeing the work and then hearing you talk about it in a way is, um, and I think it's so, so relevant in the, in the context of the school, is that constantly people are dealing with the interrelationship between creativity, like having some interesting ideas, and the implementation of that mm -hmm. through the concept of preparation. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the things that you are discussing tonight is really how you prepare, how, what you need to go through in order for a work to sort of happen. And I think in the school, this is, this is a really important thing, like how are you constructing the conditions for preparation in a way to occur? Because there are lots of creative people but actually the relationship between those, those sort of ideas and the circumstances uh, of realization, I think are really, uh, um, really important. And I, I really thank you. Can for, I for add one yeah, point yeah, sure, on this? Sure, you sure, just sure, made yeah. me think about because with architects, mm -hmm. you know, so often you're asked for a design concept, right? And in design, there's all the famous stories about designs on, on, on like napkins. But one of the things, some artists are able to totally pre-conceptualize something. But with George and I, it's never like that. We can pre-conceptualize something, and then it completely changes. And for us, one of the main things we had to learn was to follow the peripheral. Because usually your first idea or the main idea is bad. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the most obvious or something. And your intuition and your unconscious can come at it. And it's like lying in the bathtub sometimes, an idea does come. Or when you're playing around in the studio and then you discover something by a material that goes together. Or, or um, my daughter would do something and go like, wow, that's really cool. Or, you know, that sort of thing. You have to, I think for us, that's the most important thing in our art practice, to be open to whatever happens. But with architects, you can't do that. Yeah, but the, the, <laughs> what, what, what a lot of people in this room are doing are actually also not that. Yeah. Because I think the, the exciting thing about the programs, mm -hmm. you know, if you're dealing with questions of conservation, that's what I was saying to you earlier, you're dealing with aspects of memory and you do that installation and suddenly there is the, the appearance of the space, but there is also the memory of that space. Mm -hmm. and what actions do you take in order for that to be something simultaneously contemporary and at the same time it has a kind mm -hmm. of history or a kind of historicity. And I think in all the programs, there are different ways because you're using technology. I mean, you're talking about art, but actually you're talking about technology yeah. in a way and the relationship of technology to questions of representation mm -hmm. and how we, we kind of relate those to everyday life. So what I think is so uh, positive is that if you take any one of our uh, programs, actually there is a, there is a way to, 
to make a connection mm -hmm. with your work, which I found normally that doesn't happen. So <laughs> that's, that's actually very exciting. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you all very much for coming. I hope you've had a good day.